Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In this lesson, we will be analyzing the poem The Storm Wind by William Barnes. When the swift rolling brook, solemn deep, rushes on the alders, full speed, and the wild blowing winds lowly sweep over the quivering leaf and the weed, and the willow tree writhes in each limb over such beds that reel by the brim. The poem begins with powerful imagery that captures the violence and the power of the storm winds. Now these winds, they transform a landscape that might otherwise sound rather pleasant into something chaotic and frightening. The swift rolling or quickly moving brook is actually swollen deep with storm water. A brook is usually a small stream, but the storm has turned this brook into something ferocious, something huge, something heaving, something quite fast. And the smooth alliteration of swift and swollen and the assonance and consonance of rolling and swollen, they help to bring this imagery of a bloated rolling stream to life. The brook rushes past the alder trees. Alders are the trees. Okay, and the brook rushes past the alder trees along its bank at full speed as the wind blow low and wild across the land, rushing over quivering little plants. The word quivering implies fear and it is suggesting that this leaf and weed, they are shaking in terror as the wind sweeps across the land. The sounds of these lines, they again make the scene feel quite vivid for the readers. Uh, listen to the whooshing W alliteration and the sounds of L and the long E and O assonance and wild blowing winds slowly sweep over the quivering leaf and the weed. So wild blowing winds, so wild and winds blowing and lowly sweep and leaf and weed. So the poem simply sounds intense. It is evoking the force of that mighty wind. If there is, if the sounds they are filled with all alliteration, assonance, and consonants, then it suggests that the sounds are intense. And then they are over here. They are evoking the force of the mighty wind. Then the speaker turns to the willow tree. This willow tree it writhes in each limb. In other words, its branches are twisted as if they are in pain. It, they are just looking like waving arms and twisting arms and legs. Uh, the sedge beds or the grasses, the sedge beds are known as the grasses. When the sedge beds or the grasses, they also trem, tremble in the wind. And what are they doing? They are reeling. Reeling again means shivering. Again, they mean swaying. And they are swaying and reeling and shivering by the brim. Brim, which is the bank of the brook. And it is brim because it is filled with water up to the brim. Then quiver and then breathe and breathe. These are all words which are typically used to describe human movements. The speaker, the speaker is actually subtly, indirectly, in a subtle manner. It's personifying various parts of the scene in order to dramatize the wind's frightening and devastating power. And again, the sounds make the imagery more striking. Let us here listen to the assonance of such beds and the alliteration and the consonants of beds by and brim. What are these? Again, their sounds are filled with alliteration and consonants and assonance. All the categories of sounds connected, joined together to suggest how this force, to suggest the violent force of the wind. By the line six, the readers have a clear sense of the poem's rhyme scheme. Each stanza follows the pattern A, B, A, B, and C, C. Then, the meter over here is imperfect throughout the poem. The way the meter is imperfect over here in this stanza, throughout the poem also the meter is imperfect. But it adds a galloping rhythm that helps to convey the storm's power as it blasts through the landscape. Let us move on to the second stanza. The man that is staggering by holds his hat to his head by the brim. And the girl as a hay locks out fly 
puts her foot out to keep herself trim, and the quivering wavelengths overspread the small foot where the bird dips his head. The first stanza it set the stormy scene by focusing on the wind's violent effect, violent effects on the nature. In the opening lines of the second stanza, the speaker considers what it's like for a person caught in the storm. Previously, it was the field, it was the uh, it was the nature which was affected by the wind. Now it is the person who has been caught in the storm. First, the speaker notes that there is a man who is staggering by or stumbling past. He must literally hold on to his hat, gripping it by the brim so that it won't blow away. The repetition of the phrase by the brim used in the previous stanza to describe the grasses by the river wind and now over here to describe the man holding on to his hat in the wind. It emphasizes the connection between the man and the landscape at this moment. Both are equally subjected to the storm wind's fury, storm wind's violence, and the elevation of holds his hat to his head by the brim also helps to convey just how much this man is struggling. Full of elevation, holds his hat, his head, okay? full of penetration, suggesting the struggle of the man. Now, this man isn't only one caught in the storm. There is also a girl walking past, and her hair, they are swirling around her head in the wind. Her hair locks the outfly. Whatever hat she's put on them, or whatever hairdo she's done to keep them tidy, it is not working, okay? And it's outflying the locks of her hair. Her hair is actually all over the place and it reflects her lack of control. Therefore, what does she do? She puts her foot out to keep herself trim. What does it mean? It means that she puts her foot down so that she can stay steady. Okay. Next, the speaker describes the quivering wavelengths that spread over a small pool from which a bird is drinking. So this pool might be a little pond or even a puddle. The wind spreads rippling wavelengths or little waves across its surface. And then the return of the word quivering suggests that the rest of the world is terrified by the storm wind, that it trembles in fear. Not only the nature, the natural, the green part of the nature, but also the living beings, the animate objects of the nature. All of them are fearing the violence of the wind. Let us move on to the third stanza. But out at my house, in the lee of the nook, where the winds die away, the light swimming is round the tree and the low swinging ivy stem plays so soft that a mother that's nigh her still cradle may hear her baby sigh. The wild strong wind abruptly disappears in the third stanza. The poem signals this shift with the word but. It is setting up a juxtaposition between an, the nature's capacity, capacity for violence and then the safety of the speaker's home. It is in a way juxtaposing the effects of the storm outside the house and then within the house. Outside the house, it is violent. But inside the house, it is completely opposite. <clears throat> but out at my house in the lee of the nook where the winds die away. So the speaker's house, it sits in a little corner of the land that is sheltered from the wind. Okay, na? One corner of the land that is sheltered. Lee means that is sheltered from the winds. Now what once seemed violent, seemed ferocious, it now transforms into something pleasant and peaceful. It becomes light swimming ears and gentle swirl around the tree and through the low swinging ivy. So the wind becomes playful. It becomes music, musical over here rather than threatening. And it play as it plays so soft that a mother who's nigh 
یعنی کہ ہو از نیئر دا کریڈل آف اے سلیپنگ چائلڈ کین ایکچولی ہیئر ہر چائلڈ سائے سو دیر از نو نوائز سو دا وائلنس آف دا ونڈ از آؤٹ سائڈ دا باؤنڈریز آف دا ہاؤس now it is not entirely clear if the speaker is simply using this image of a mother and sighing baby figuratively that is that they are not really there yani ke they are not really there but it's figuratively suggestive that even if there was a child over there with the mother the mother could have heard the child sigh okay so the speaker is using them as an analogy to illustrate just how delicate and the delightful the wind is inside the house and on the other hand it is also possible that this mother is in fact the speaker's wife and that baby is the speaker's child and that they are right there alongside the speaker so that the speaker can actually look at the situation and share with the audience so in any case in any case it is hard to believe that this scene takes place so to close to the man desperately trying to hold on to his hat <coughs> excuse me so it is next to impossible it is impossible to believe that this scene is actually taking place close to that same man who was desperately trying to hold on to his hat so the peaceful and why is that because peaceful moments like this they are perhaps all the more precious in the light of knowing what exists beyond the nook that contains the speaker's house yani ki it becomes more important when we find out that the wind is as threatening as it was still present but the issue is that the wind is outside the house and within the house the atmosphere is completely different okay so it becomes precious only if we know that something that exists beyond the nook uh, is the speaker's house and after the nook the after the house outside the house is the same strong threatening wind now this image it symbolizes the comfort of home and family the mother and child they provide metaphorical shelter from the storms of wind now this brings us on to the themes present in the poem the storm wind the first theme is the awesome power of the huge power of the nature the storm wind actually illustrates the power of nature as it whips up a storm creating chaos and danger now nature in the poem is actually capable of great terror and destruction whether it is human being or other forms of nature everything including humanity is at the mercy of this storm the second theme happens to be the comfort and safety of home now the storm can contrast the chaos and terror of a storm with the serenity and peace inside the speaker's house the poem presents home as a calming place a shelter from the metaphorical storm winds of life and the literal storm winds as well So the world outside in the storm and that inside speaker's home could hardly be more different the storm is wild fierce and destructive it is the same okay but because the home has a shelter therefore it is a completely a different picture inside the house so the speaker's house meanwhile is quiet and calm it is so calm inside the speaker's house that a woman can hear the sighs of a sleeping baby so the sweet the soothing sweetness of the scene suggests the comforting power of home and family both both of them act as a refuge and shelter from the inevitable storms of life offering peace and perspective in the face of hardship let us move on to the symbols of the poem there is only one symbol in the poem that is the storm wind so on one level the poem is about a little storm the winds howling through the first two stanzas reflect the very real power of the natural world it is also possible to read the poem as an allegory however and to interpret the storm wind of the title as symbolizing the trials and tribulations of life 
so the how is it going to be allegory as because the characters are the symbols of tribulations and trials and difficulties of life and what character are we talking we talking about the storm so therefore life can get stormy and the fact that these winds die away around the speaker's house becoming nothing more than light swimming is it suggests that home and family can provide a refuge from life's pain now let us move on to the poetic devices and figurative language within the poem 